Brownian motion is a Markov process. We initially constructed the pre-Brownian motion as a Markov process, a la Kolmogorov's extension theorem, and then only recently showed that there is a continuous path version of that process. But that version doesn't change the essential character of the Markov process. Remember, the Markov property, which we stated in several different forms, says that as the process evolves, when it reaches a certain state at some time t, then its evolution afterward is identical to a process starting in whatever state it got to at time t, and then proceeding from there fresh. Now, in the case of discrete time stochastic processes, we proved an even stronger version, the strong Markov property, which said that the same holds true even if we stop at a stopping time. Let a Markov process evolve until a stopping time, tau, and stop the process there, then it's in some random state at that time. If we then allow the evolution to continue from then in the original process, that's exactly the same as starting a new Markov process fresh in whatever random state it was in at the stopping time, tau. We're going to spend the next three lectures proving the same result holds for continuous time processes, modulo some technical conditions that have to hold. We will show in particular that Brownian motion satisfies the strong Markov property. In this context, we're going to heavily rely upon the regularity of the paths of the process. And so to be careful, let's introduce some notation here. Our state space is going to be a general metric space S, which we usually assume is separable and complete. And we'll let gamma denote one of the three function spaces where the paths of our processes have lived. We could just take the full space of all functions from the positive time interval into the state space, but that's not going to cut it for what we'll need to do in the continuous time setting. We will either want to assume that we have genuinely continuous paths or at least right continuous paths. The canonical example of a continuous path process, of course, for us is Brownian motion. We also have a canonical example of a right continuous process, the Poisson process. In each case, we will equip this new state space for the path space valued random variable that is our stochastic process with the cylinder sigma field. That is, C of gamma is the smallest sigma field with respect to which all of the projections are measurable. Those projections are just the restrictions of the projection on the full function space. Pi t of any function from the positive time interval into s is the map pi t, which takes a path omega, to the state omega of t. In lecture 46.1, we proved the strong Markov property for discrete time Markov processes. In fact, that same proof holds for continuous time Markov processes, provided that the stopping time takes only a countable number of times in its range. Here's the theorem. We start with a filtered probability space and a fixed Markov transition semigroup on our state space. Let xt be a time homogeneous Markov process with paths even in here is fine, or in here, or in here, whose transition semigroup is the given qt. Now remember that that process is really a family of processes indexed by the starting distribution. And typically we will start it in a deterministic point, so the starting distribution will be a point mass at some x in the state space, although in the statement of the theorem here we'll also need to start it at a random point as well. Then the theorem is as follows in this setup. If tau is a stopping time relative to this filtration, using the definitions from the last few lectures, with only countably many times in its range, then for any bounded measurable function on the space gamma. So this is a function on path space, one of these three, measurable with respect to the cylinder sigma field. We have the following property. If we take the process x shifted by time tau, that is, we take x at tau plus t, evolving as t ranges from zero up to infinity, 
and then condition that on the stopped sigma field at time tau, then that f tau measurable random variable can be computed as follows. We instead just take that same function of the original process started at zero, take the expectation of that to give us a number, but a number dependent on the initial state of the process, x. We know this function is a measurable function of x, as we proved earlier. And then we evaluate that function at the random variable x tau, which we just finished proving when tau is a stopping time, is f tau measurable. Of course, that only makes sense to do in the event that tau is less than infinity. And on that event, these two are equal almost surely. Of course, evaluating these conditional expectations or just the scalar expectation of them at all of these test functions recovers the entire law of this process if we think of that law as a probability measure on this sigma field. And so this tells us that the law of the process shifted by tau is the same as the law of the original process started at x tau. As I said, the proof of this is nearly identical to the one that we gave for the discrete time setting in lecture 46.1, but let's go through it again just to jog our memories. We'll start by enumerating the range of the stopping time tau. Let's denote it as the set of times tn with n ranging through some indexing set n, which might be a proper subset of the natural numbers because this range could even be finite. And we may or may not have infinity as a possible value for tau. We'll include it, but it may never be achieved. We will not list it among the index times tn so that we can then enumerate the event tau less than infinity as the union of this countable family of events that tau is equal to one of the tns. Now let's just compute. The left-hand side of the desired equality is this conditional expectation here. Now, in lecture 45.3, we showed how to condition a random variable on this sigma field in the case where tau was a discrete stopping time. But of course, nothing in that proof required the stopping time to take values one, two, three, etc. All that was required is that it had countable range. So we can use that exact formulation here. And so compute this conditional expectation as the sum over n of the conditional expectation of f of x tau plus dot given ftn on the event that tau is equal to tn. Now notice that since tau is a stopping time, the event that tau is equal to tn is in ftn which means that we can move this indicator function inside the conditional expectation. But once that's inside there, that means that this tau is really just Tn. And now we can go ahead and move this indicator back outside again. Now we've reduced inside this sum our strong Markov property statement to the usual Markov property here. Here we have fixed times here, and the usual Markov property says exactly that this conditional expectation is the expected value of just f at the process x starting at zero, starting in state x, where x is evaluated at the random variable process at time tn. But now once we've done that, we have this sum of these evaluated here on the event that tau is equal to tn, and that's exactly how we define the evaluation of a function at x equals tau. But again, this is on the event 
that tau is finite, otherwise we'd have to have one more term in the sum, the event that tau is equal to infinity. And there we have it. This is equal to this, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Now note from this proof, as I alluded to, the path space structure of gamma, be it continuous paths or right continuous paths, or just all functions from the positive time interval into S, played no role in this proof. When tau has countable range, it just always works. We've only included it here to note that it doesn't matter which version of the process we choose, this continuous time but discrete valued stopping time case works in any path space realization. Now, of course, our goal is to extend this beyond the countable range tau version that we've just proved. We want to prove the strong Markov property for any stopping time in continuous time. Well, that's not quite going to work in total generality. We're going to need some regularity conditions on the process in order for that to hold, but those conditions are going to be easily satisfied by every process we've ever looked at in this course. The method we're going to use is a what should now be to you a very standard idea to approximate. We have this property holding for certain kinds of taus, what we'd like to do is take the general tau that we're interested in and approximate it by taus of this form. And if we can use the convergence theorems that we've proved throughout this course to show that both sides of our equation converge appropriately under that approximation, then we've proved the result that we want. So the first step is to approximate a general stopping time by times of this form. And actually we can do better than that. We can approximate even optional times by stopping times of this form. And here's how we're going to do it. For any random time tau, we'll define tau n as follows. It's going to be the ceiling of 2 to the n times tau divided by 2 to the n. To be precise, this is, well, if tau takes infinite value, then so does this. So this is infinity on the set where tau equals infinity. And then if we sum up over the intervals where tau takes value between k minus one over two to the n and k over two to the n for some integer k, it takes value k over two to the n, the right endpoint approximation. But as soon as we actually get to the right endpoint, it actually jumps up to the next value. These random times here certainly have countable range. The range is just all numbers of the form k over 2 to the n for fixed n, k ranging through the positive integers. So what we need to do is show that this is a stopping time, so it satisfies these conditions, and approximates tau well enough. So here are those results. If tau is any optional time relative to the filtration that we started with, and we define tau n the way we just did, then those tau n's are actually stopping times, and they satisfy the following properties. They converge pointwise to tau. In fact, they decrease to tau at all points. The stopped sigma field of tau n contains the stopped sigma field of tau. In fact, it contains the right continuous augmentation of it. And tau n and tau are infinite on exactly the same event. Now, before we get into this, let's just note that two of these statements are pretty clear from the start. This one here is immediate from the definition. Since we see that tau n is infinite exactly here and finite in all of the cases. And as for this property here, well, that follows for any real number tau. If tau is just a fixed real number, and we define tau n to be this sequence, tau n is just defined to be k over 2 to the n, where k is the smallest integer greater than 2 to the n times tau. So of course that means k over 2 to the n is bigger than tau. You can easily check that as you increase n, this approximation can only decrease, and the fact that tau n converges to tau is just from the fact that the dyadic rationals are dense in the reals. So this is also true point-wise. 
And so all we really need to show is that tau n is a stopping time that satisfies this inclusion property here. Well, to show it's a stopping time, we want to show that this event is in the sigma field ft for each t greater than or equal to zero. So fix some t greater than or equal to zero. Of course, we know that that t will be in one of these unique partition intervals. We can find a unique integer k so that t is strictly less than k over 2 to the n, but greater than or equal to k minus 1 over 2 to the n. And if that's the case, then the event that tau n is less than or equal to t, because tau n only takes values in the dyadic rationals with denominator 2 to the n, that will be the same as the event that tau n is less than or equal to k minus 1 over 2 to the n. But that's just a finite union of the events that tau n is equal to j over 2 to the n, where j ranges from 1 up to k minus 1. But from the definition up above, the event that tau n is equal to j over 2 to the n is exactly equal to the event that tau is in between j minus 1 over 2 to the n inclusive and j over 2 to the n. So this is the union of these events. Of course, those are all disjoint as well, and we easily check that that's therefore the same as the event that tau is less than k minus 1 over 2 to the n. But tau is an optional time, and so that event is in f k minus 1 over 2 to the n. And since k minus 1 over 2 to the n is less than or equal to t, that's contained in ft, which shows that this event is in ft, and therefore tau n is a stopping time. Now we just need to show this inclusion holds true. Well, from the definition, remember that an event A is in f tau n if and only if the intersection of A with the event that tau n is less than or equal to t is in f t for every positive time t. Now again, with k chosen for a particular t like this up above, as we just saw, that event that tau n is less than or equal to t is the event that tau is less than k minus 1 over 2 to the n. And from the definition of f tau plus, that is in f k minus 1 over 2 to the n. But as we noted above, that's contained in f t. So that shows that if a is in here, then a intersects the event that tau n is less than or equal to t is in f t, which is exactly to say by definition that a is in f tau n that shows this conclusion holds true and concludes our proof. That puts us in a good position to prove the strong Markov property. Next time we will state the precise conditions that are needed in order for our Markov process to have that property and proceed with using this approximation to prove it.